bulletin that's really, really, really important. If you open your bulletin, there's a little section in there with a paragraph, and, and the food pantry really, really needs our help right now. They are looking for donations. So if you guys could help us out by bringing in any kind of dry and canned food so we can get that to the food pantry, we would really appreciate that. Uh, you know, all the churches in the community come together to try and help to feed those in need, and this is our opportunity to join in with our brothers and sisters in Christ and do that, okay? So please, please bring in some, some canned goods for the food pantry. Um, also, uh, tonight at 6 p.m., we are going to be getting here together to watch The Chosen. The Chosen is a video series about Jesus and his disciples, and it is, it is excellent. It will bring the scriptures to life for you in a way that you probably have never thought about it before. Uh, so that's tonight. We're watching Season 2, Episode 2. Um, Thursday, there is a Bible study on the parables of Jesus. That starts at 515. Um, also, July 13th through the 15th, we are having vacation Bible school. And I know Tracy needs help. If you can help wrangle kids, if you can help duct tape kids to walls, <laughs> if you can help lasso kids, they can use your help, okay? So talk with Tracy, get with myself, and I'll send you to Tracy, okay? All right. Now, before we get started, we all know the, per the reason for this weekend, right? Yeah, we're going to get together with family members, and we're going to grill hot dogs and hamburgers, and today they're, they're, uh, there's a pig that made a sacrifice for us to be able to have this church dinner together. But the reason why we can celebrate outside in the open like this, the reason why we can gather in the church in public with no fear, is because someone was willing to give up their life for you to have this freedom. And so as you go about worshiping today, as you go about, you know, spending time with your families, don't forget that. No, no, I'm not saying I'm not saying we worship the soldiers or anything like that, but where we worship because of them. We have this right because of them to do this openly and publicly. So as you worship today, as you praise Jesus outside today, do it celebrating the freedom that they bought for you. Would you stand and worship with us? All right, good morning. We're still going to sing about coming into the house of the Lord, even though we're outside today. And I said, if we're going to be outside, I better get some help. <laughs> so I'm thankful to have um, our, our friend I just met, remember from school, Kyle's going to play bass with us, and, and my dad, Donnie, and, and my good friend, Tim Whiteside. So um, y'all help us sing this first song this morning. <laughs> We worship the God who was, we worship the God who is, we worship the God who ever more will be. He opened the prison doors, he parted the raging sea, my God, he owes the victory. Come on. There's joy in the house of the Lord, there's joy in the house of the Lord today, and we won't be quiet. We shout out in praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is showing you this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out his praise. We sing to the God who always makes a way Cause he hung up on that cross And he carried on that grave My God still rolls stones away There's joy in the house of the Lord There's joy in the house of the Lord today And we won't be quiet We shout out his praise There's joy in the house of the Lord our God is showing in this place, and we won't be quiet, no, we shout out His praise. We were the 
the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We're forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. Come on, church. We were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We were forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out His praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's God is showing in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out His praise. Come on, you know it now. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out His praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is showing in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out His praise. this morning Tracy came up and scared me to death and started singing with me I said you should come up here and sing this morning she knows these songs better than I do I think there's a room
than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest thing, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Come on, church, sing it with me. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. request to you because of what you have done for us on the cross. It's by your blood that we are saved. It's by your blood and spirit in us that we are made righteous before your throne, God. And yes, God, we, we, we're worshiping outside today, enjoying the freedom that we have. But even, even in that freedom, God, we can't, we can't pat ourselves on the back and say, yeah, I earned this for myself. 
God, we're here worshiping you today. We're praising you because people who loved us, people who never met us, went and laid down their life to purchase this freedom for us. And God, we thank you for them. We thank you for their sacrifice. We thank you for their families that, that let them go and sent them off. God, they, they bought this for us, and there's not anything that we can do to ever repay them. There's not enough thank yous. There's not enough gift cards. There's not enough. But, Lord, they did that not for the gift cards, not for the thank yous. No, they did it so we could enjoy this freedom, so we could glorify you with our lips. And not have to do it in fear, not have to do it in hiding, but we can do it right here, out in the public, where all can see, when all can hear the name of Jesus be proclaimed. Amen. And we thank you, God, for that. God, I know we're outside. But Lord, there is nowhere we can go where your presence is not with us. There's no battle that we can face that your presence isn't already there fighting on our behalf. There isn't any moment where we think we're alone or are full of despair where, where you're not there, God. You're always with us. You're always there by our side. And Lord, as your people today, as we gather and worship you, we believe that you're here with us. We believe that your spirit is filling not just the building, but it's filling our hearts. It's filling the, this parking lot. It's filling these, these, these covers out here, God. It's going to fill this, this entire grounds today. And wherever these words echo, these words that are proclaiming your truth and boldly declaring you as Lord, I pray that, that when, they're, when they are heard, they reach hearts. And in this dark and scary time, may they find hope in the name of Jesus. And it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Just thinking about how good it all sounds and just being out here together on this hill. We're blessed to be able to do that today. I think you all can grab on this song pretty easy. No, now she can sing all sing holy, holy get together. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Holy, holy is He. Sing a new song to Him who set song. Heaven's mercy see. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. The creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything and I will adore you. Thank you. 
the mention of your name. Jesus, your name is power, breath and living water. goes my notes. I guess that means I don't need them, right? Um, the offering box is up here. If you want to give your tithes and offerings, we're not going to pass the plates around today. So at the end of the service, you feel, you know, God lays it in your heart to give. The box is right there. Uh, if you have a Bible, turn with me to the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 1. I don't know about you, but this has not been a good week. It has not. Um, all you had to do was turn on the news for five seconds and and your heart broke. Am I right? And then if you thought that was bad enough, reports come out about people who play positions of trust within the church doing things that they shouldn't be doing. And then just, mm, it just completely rips your heart out. It crushes you. And if that, you know, and that's that, all that. That's on top of living in a time in a world where gas prices keep going up, morality keeps dropping. Some of us were probably wondering, man, how am I even going to pay for food this week? I don't, I don't know. I have, to, I have to decide between paying for food or paying for gas to get to work. And these are dark days. But did you know there's a book in the Bible that was written specifically to the church during a dark time? And that's the book of Revelation. So many times when we say the book of Revelation, we focus on the fear, we focus on how things are all going to play out, but that's not why it was written. Revelation was given to John while he was stranded alone on an island to die. And God came to him with this message of hope in the midst of the darkness. So today we're going to be looking at this message of hope and, 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 and seeing how it, how it relates to us in our day and time. It's Revelation chapter 1, and I'm going to read verses 9 through 20. It says, I, John, your brother and partner in the affliction, kingdom, and endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God 
in the testimony of Jesus. And I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And I heard a loud voice behind me like a trumpet saying, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Then I turned to see whose voice it was that spoke to me. When I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was one like the Son of Man, dressed in a robe and with a golden sash wrapped around his chest. The hair of his head was white as wool, white as snow, and his eyes like a fiery flame. His feet were like fine bronze as, it's fire, as it is fired in a furnace and his voice like the sound of cascading waters. He had seven stars in his right hand. A sharp double-edged sword came from his mouth, and his face was shining like the sun at full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. He laid his right hand on me and said, Don't be afraid. I am the first and the last, and the living one. I was dead, but look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death in Hades. Therefore, write what you have seen, what is, and what will take place after this. The mystery of the seventy stars you saw on my right hand, and of the seven golden lampstands. The mystery is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. The seven lampstands are the seven churches. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Like I said, this was written to the church during a time of intense persecution. There's some debate on to who the Roman emperor was at this time. It was either Domitian or Nero, and neither one of them were good. Nero decided he wanted a bigger palace, so he burned down half the village and then blamed it on the Christians. Domitian, he was just not a good guy. But you see what, what this meant, though, this time of persecution, if you were baptized in the name of Jesus, it was, it was a sure mark that you were going to be killed for your faith. To, to worship Jesus was going to put you in opposition with the culture around you who worshiped Caesar. And at this point, I'm not sure how many of the apostles are left, but there's not many. John's one of the few. And John has been captured. He's been taken to this, uh, this prison colony where there's nothing there. And the Romans just dumping there and leaving for dead. Now, if you're a pastor, if there's one, and if you're someone who's answered a call to ministry, there's one thing that you live and breathe for every day of your life. That is to wake up and serve Jesus by serving those around you. And this pastor who has given his life to that, who was commissioned by Jesus to go and do that, is now left on this island to die with no contact from his churches, no word of how they're doing. He can't even intercede in prayer for the request on their behalf because he doesn't know what they are. That's a dark moment. That's a dark time in his life. But John doesn't sit there in a self-pity party. He knows it's the Lord's day. Because you see the Christians, you know, the actual Sabbath, you know, from the Ten Commandments where it says, keep, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. For the Jews, that was Saturday. But when Jesus, didn't, Jesus was dead in the tomb on Saturday, right? But what did Jesus, day did Jesus rise again on? Sunday. He rose again on a Sunday. He came back to life on a Sunday. So the early church... They thought, we're not going to worship on a day where our Savior's dead. We're going to worship on the day when he was, rose again. We're going to celebrate each and every time we gather that the fact that our Lord is risen and he is risen indeed. So that's where the, when the church gathered. And John knew it was the Lord's day. So this day he gets up just like he would worship any other day, just as he would gather with the church any other time. But this time he's by himself. He gets up and, and it's in that moment. That he's caught up in the spirit. There's a lot of debate on what this passage means, but 
But all we know for sure is John had a, an experience with the Holy Spirit. And, th and then what is recorded in what we read today is that experience that he has. Alone, deserted on this island, this is what happens to him. Alone, deserted on this island, he still gathers in the Spirit of the Lord on the Lord's Day to worship. And this is what happens. It tells us in verse, in verse 12, Then I turn to see whose voice it was. He hears a loud voice, and when he turns and sees... It describes who he sees standing there with him. Do you hear what I'm saying? He, he was left stranded to die on this island by himself in the hopelessness of the situation. But who was right there with him? This voice. It says, and he was one like the Son of Man. Son of Man is a title that Jesus uses for himself from the book of Daniel. And he uses it over and over again. He's dressed in a robe with a golden sash around his, around his waist. That golden sash, that was the appearance of the high priest. And when Jesus died and rose again, he ascended to the Father's side where he is our high priest. He intercedes with God on our behalf for us. So John's stranded on this island, left to die, hopeless. And in this moment, Jesus comes to John. He's right there with him. It says his, his hair was white as wool, white as snow. His eyes like a fiery flame. That, that his eyes were like fire because that was demonstrating that he was the omnipotent one, that he was God, and he knew what was going on. All the events that was happening in John's life, Jesus knew about. All the events that were happening, that were happening to the churches, Jesus knew about. He knew it all, and he was right there with John. It says his feet were like fine bronze as it's fired in a furnace. That's symbolic telling us that this Jesus who died and rose again, whose hair was white, whose eyes were like fire, his feet were immovable. It was a sign of his, his permanence, his sustainability. It's the God who never grows tired. It's the God who never quits. It's the God who always keeps loving, always keeps going. And that's who appeared to John when he was at his most desperate. Jesus. This Jesus. It tells us that he had a double-edged sword coming from his mouth. And if you go online and you Google pictures of this, you're going to see some really weird stuff. So don't do it. Okay? <laughs> the sword coming out of Jesus' mouth isn't like, it isn't a battle instrument. Like we would see it. It's not a weapon of human hands. So if, if you, know, you see a depiction of this as Jesus wielding a sword from his mouth and lopping off heads, that's not it. What this is saying is that what's coming out of Jesus' mouth are the words of truth. And when God speaks truth into our lives, remember, it has this ability to cut through all of the facade. It has the ability to cut down to the very core of who we are and hit us right where we're at. And Jesus always comes when he gives us a word like that. It's always the word we need in the moment. Sometimes that word is judgment. Sometimes that word is a challenge. But sometimes when we're broken and devastated, we don't understand what's happening. The truth that comes to us is somehow in the midst of all the chaos and all the pain and all the doubt, we have this, this voice of our Savior coming to us, cutting through all the lies, cutting through all the brokenness, and reminding us of who we belong to and who loves us. And that the situation may seem hopeless, but Jesus is standing there right with you. Yes. And that's who was right there with John in this moment. As cool as that is, though, this is what Jesus says to John. He, all these other things it talks about. But this is what he says to John in verses 17 through 20. He, you know, John sees Jesus. He's in the presence of God. And he just falls at his feet. He's just like, I, I'm not worthy to be standing here. Keep in mind, this is the same John, John the Apostle, remember who? Who when they're at the Last Supper with Jesus in person, what does this John do? Does anybody know? What does this John do at the Last Supper? Come on, somebody's got to know. No? 
when they're at the Last Supper and they get done eating, this, this is the same John that reclines and rests his head against Jesus' chest. That's how close the friendship was between John and Jesus. And in this moment where John is desperate and Jesus shows up because of Jesus' holy appearance, because of the power of the resurrection surging through Jesus in this moment, this John falls down on his face. Because he realizes he's not worthy to be in this situation. But notice what Jesus says to him. What is it that Jesus says? says Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I'm right here with you. Don't be afraid, John. You're not alone. Don't be afraid, John. I haven't forgotten you. Don't be afraid about the unknown, John, because I know it. He says, I am the first and the last. He's saying there's nothing that starts without me and there's nothing that's going to end without me. So don't be afraid. He says, I am the living one. Yes, I died, but that tomb is empty. There's nobody there. I am alive. And I'm, as you can see, I'm standing here with you. Not only that, Jesus tells John, he says, I am alive forevermore and I hold the keys of death. I hold the keys to life. I hold the keys over sin. I have the keys over all the enemies. I have all authority given to me. <coughs> there is nothing that happens or that can happen without me. There is nothing final in your life that will happen without my say so. Jesus gets the last word. And that's the Jesus that's standing there with John. And as cool as that is, in verse 9, that verse, uh, verse 19 tells us why John writes this book. He writes this book simply because God tells him to. He tells John, write this down. So what does John do? He writes it down. Doesn't sugarcoat it, doesn't give us a key to understand it. He just writes it down. But here's the beauty of Revelation. Here's, the, to me, the most beautiful verse in all of Scripture. This is what Jesus says. He says, The mystery of the seven stars you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands are the seven churches. You're like, Pastor Jason, what does that even mean? That makes no sense. Why are you so excited? Because once you understand what this means, it means there is absolutely nothing that will happen to you. There is no place you will ever be where Jesus won't be with you. Because this is what it means. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And what does the word angel mean? It means messenger. And yes, throughout Revelation, when it speaks of angels, it's actually talking of the heavenly beings that are, that are all, all serving as God's messengers between us and him. They're serving as God's workmen on our behalf. But in this case, messenger is referring to the pastors of these seven churches. Jesus is saying, John, those churches that you're worried about in this dark time, that you don't know that's happening, look, I've got them in my hand. They're with me. And I am not, not only are they with me, but I'm standing right here with you and you're not alone. And it goes on, Jesus is telling us, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. And yes, there are seven churches that Jesus is going to give words to in the next several chapters. But what does the number seven mean in Scripture? The number seven is a number of completion. So yes, it's talking specifically to these seven churches. But these seven churches represent the church universal, the church complete, the church of God's saints from yesterday to tomorrow and forever. That's who these left stands represent. And what this means is Jesus has the pastors in his hands. He has the churches in his hands. And there is nothing, not a thing that can prevail against them because he has the final say because he's in authority over them. So what does all I have to say to us? Why am I so excited in saying it's a message of hope for us? 
Well, we live in a world where kids get shot in school, don't we? And we sit there and we look at that and we say, how could the, how could the world be so cruel? How could it be this way? And I, I'm not giving this to you as a platitude. I'm not giving this to you as, as some secret formula that's going to make all the hurt to go away. It's simply a reminder that in these darkest moments, Jesus is still there and Jesus cares. Amen. He knows each and every name of every student that died this week. He knows the name of each and every, every teacher that died this week. He knows the name of each and every person that was connected with that situation. And you know what Jesus is doing in this moment? He's doing the same thing he did when he got to that tomb and Lazarus was dead. He was weeping with them. And Jesus in that moment knew he was going to bring Lazarus back to life. And he still cried. Why? Because it broke his heart because he cared. Amen. Jesus cares, church. He does. You may be having a week of your own. But I want you to know Jesus cares. Jesus cares about his church. Yes, church, we are living in a dark time. I'm not going to pretend it's not different. I'm not going to pretend it's, it's not all sunshine and rainbows, or it is all sunshine and rainbows. But I do know this. This is the same, we serve the same Jesus that has the seven stars in his hand. We serve the same Jesus who is, was with his church in this time of deep, dark persecution that was occurring. And if you think for a second that that Jesus who cares about you is going to abandon his church in our day, you are mistaken. Jesus loves us. Jesus has a purpose for us. Jesus' mission for us is still the same. And guess what? He is going to go with us to help us fulfill it. Jesus is right there with us. Because Jesus cares about his churches. And yes, some of the stuff in the news about the church is not good. And yeah, it's going to give us a black eye. Yes, it's going to make it difficult for us to minister. It's going to turn some people off. But I do know this, when revival happens, judgment always begins at the house of the Lord. It always starts with us. Before revival happens anywhere else. And Jesus is going to help us navigate these times. Jesus is going to reassure us in these times. Jesus is going to be our confidence in these times. So Jesus cares. Jesus cares about his church. And most importantly of all, Jesus cares about you. You specifically. You might be a little kid here today upset because your cat ran away. Well, let me tell you a little story. Back when I was in third grade, I had this pet cat that ran away from home. And I was so distraught about it. Bye notes. It was so distraught about it. And I prayed every day about that cat. And one day I went to church three weeks later and the cat was at the church on the other side of town. Wow. So if you think Jesus doesn't care about your cat problem, you're mistaken. Jesus cares, tell it to him. Hey, you may have made a mess of your life. You may have made a bunch of bad decisions. But Jesus cares about you saying, hey, nah, uh That bad decision you made, it doesn't have the final say over your life. I do. Amen. And I care about you and I have a plan for your life. Jesus cares about you no matter where you're at, what you have done. We just have to be willing to put our faith in him and our hope in him. See, why I find this a message of hope, why I find it so pertinent for today, is because John couldn't go to where he wanted to go. He couldn't go gather with God's people and worship with them. He couldn't go and experience the, the presence of God's Holy Spirit and the fellowship of his people worshiping together. But what did Jesus do in this moment? 
the most Jesus thing ever. When John could not go to where he was, Jesus came to him. Right. That could be a song, you know. Some of you got it. Jesus came to where John was. I know, you may be here today and you may be having all kinds of doubts. You may be carrying all kinds of brokenness and hurt. You're saying, Jesus, I don't know that I have the strength to come to you. And once you know that, that Jesus is looking at you saying, that's okay, I'll come to you. I'll come to you right where you're at. Our hope has to be in Jesus. And Jesus wants to be our hope. That's where our confidence is, needs to rest. I'm going to invite Jeremy and Tim and the, and the crew back up. And as we sing this last this, this song again, I hope that your hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. <coughs> because he loves you. He cares about you. And he has you in his hand. building that's the most important part we can build everything we have on that hope we have in Jesus and like Jason said he'll never leave us never forsake us he'll always be where we need him to be for us when darkness seems to hide his face, I'll rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. My anchor holds within the veil. Come on, church. Sound. 
Oh, may I then in him be found Dressed in his righteousness alone Faultless stand before the throne Dear Jesus, we thank you that you're always with us and that there's no place we can go that you won't come and meet us. Now, Jesus, in these dark days, would you be our hope? And would you strengthen our, our trust in you? Strengthen our confidence in you? And help us to go and shine your light into a world that is desperate for hope of any kind. But Lord, we have you, the hope of all hopes. I hope that is steadfast and sure. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. I'm not sure really what the next step is. Anybody have an idea? <laughs>